Hi everyone. So far we have covered cycles of the earth, we have covered photosynthesis, and we have covered cellular respiration. So now we're going to get into biomolecules. In other words, we're going to start talking about the molecules that make it possible for us to live. But before we really get into the meat of who, what, where, why, and how about biomolecules, I need to define a couple of things for you. And the first thing is compounds. Compounds are really any molecule that contains more than one type of atom. So that could be pretty much anything. But we split compounds into a couple of different categories, largely either organic compounds or inorganic compounds. So an organic compound, you've probably heard the term organic before a bunch of times in your life, um, but it means something a little different than you would think that it means in the grocery store, because in the grocery store, they use organic to mean hasn't been sprayed with a bunch of different pesticides and this and that, but that's not actually what organic means. To be organic, it means to contain carbon. So an organic compound is a compound or a chemical that contains carbon atoms. So um, a good example of that on the left would be glucose, the sugar that gets produced in photosynthesis and that we use in cellular respiration. That's an organic compound because it has carbon in it, as you can see here. And in the picture of it, you can see here, technically there's a carbon atom at each of these points as well. Okay, the other category is inorganic compounds, which is basically everything else. Compounds are chemicals that do not have carbon in them. So water is an inorganic compound. Table salt is an inorganic compound, sodium chloride, that you've all looked at before. Um, but why is carbon important? Why do we have an entire class of compounds that is defined by them having carbon? Well, that's because carbon is found in pretty much every, not pretty much every, every single living thing. Carbon is the atom that is the base of all of our molecules that make it possible for us to live in our body, all those big ones. And the reason it's so important is because carbon, due to its structure and how its electrons are organized and a bunch of different things that you won't really learn about until chemistry, because of a lot of different factors, it can bond up to four times. And that's very important because carbon, one carbon atom can bond with four other things. It could bond with another carbon, it could bond with a lot of other things, and that makes it very versatile in terms of how many different kinds of molecules you can make with carbon, which is why all of our biomolecules in our body are carbon-based because it is so versatile. Um, the, the title of this slide is HONC, H-O-N-C, and that's because of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, and those are going to be the main four components that are found in living things. So 96% of all life on earth have hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. And so here's a nice picture example of um, one representation of how those elements would look, but those are the main four. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon are going to be the main four. Now I want to talk about the building blocks of molecules. You're going to hear a lot of fancy terminology in this lecture. One of those is the word monomer, and a monomer is basically a tiny building block of a bigger molecule that bigger molecule is the polymer. So here on the right, we have a picture representation of monomers and polymers, and you see that this monomer here is three basic pieces, two blue pieces and a red piece, and you see that the polymer down here is made up of one, two, three of those monomers. So imagine putting Legos together. You have three or you have a small Lego, and if you put three of them together, you can make a bigger structure. And that's exactly what molecules do. There's little, little pieces, and then they string themselves together to make bigger pieces. If you have a really, really, really big polymer, we call that a macromolecule. So let me just break that word apart for you to make it a little bit easier. The root macro 
means big, large scale. And then molecule obviously refers to molecules. So the term macromolecule quite literally means big molecules. Okay? So once again, we're going back to that ability to break down words to make them more understandable for yourself. Okay, so let's review. What's the difference between a monomer and a polymer? Well, a monomer is a small building block. A polymer is many of those strung together. What's an organic compound? Something that contains carbon. What four elements make up 96% of all living things? Honk. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. So that's what I wanted you to take from all those first few slides. Okay? This video here, I will link on Canvas for you, but this goes over the different kinds of molecules. So I would like you to watch this after our notes video is over. Okay? So I'm going to talk now about the different molecules that exist in life. Okay? So there's four main classes of organic compounds. And again, four main classes of molecules that contain carbon. That's what that organic compounds mean. There's carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. All of these are going to contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Some of them might contain nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus as well. Um, so there's going to be ways to tell the difference between these and I will go over those as I get there. Carbohydrates is the first one that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so you've probably heard of carbs before. I would be very surprised if you hadn't. But you'll hear a lot of people saying things like, oh, carbs are bad for you. Don't eat so many carbs, blah, 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 blah. No, no. A lot of the diet fads that you hear in your life are not lies, but they go too far. Because people will make a blanket statement saying carbs are bad. No, they're not. You need carbohydrates to live. Too many carbs is not a good thing. But carbs in and of themselves are not bad to eat. You need them because glucose is a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are at their cores sugars or starches. So anytime that you see a word that ends in this O-S-E, like, for example, glucose, that's a sugar. Sucrose is a sugar. This is actually table sugar that you would just have in your house. Um, fructose, you've heard of high fructose corn syrup. That's, this is a sugar. There's some ones with a lot more fun names. Uh, there's a galactose. There's regular lactose, there's arabinose, there's a bunch of other ones. Um, but the main thing that I wanted you to take from that is that, hey, they all end in OSE. Sugars are going to contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in this particular ratio. One carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. So to explain what I mean by that, I'm going to take glucose, which is c 6 H12O6, okay? For every one of these carbons, there's two hydrogens. For every one of these carbons, there's one oxygen. So if we divided all those little subscripts by six, we would get C1H2O1. That's all that this means, okay? So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, the monomer or the building block of a carbohydrate is something called a monosaccharide. Say that with me real quick, monosaccharide. So let's break that word apart. We have mono, meaning one, and we have saccharide, which refers to sugar. So a monosaccharide, one sugar, or a simple sugar is another term for that. Um, examples of that would be glucose and fructose because glucose is a relatively small molecule as is fructose. The function of carbs are for energy transport in animals. Think about it. We eat sugars so that we can do cellular respiration to gain energy. That's what they're for. And once again, that O-S-E ending means you are looking at a sugar. 
Um, there's a couple of other forms of sugars that you could run into. We have things called disaccharides. We have things called polysaccharides. So the pr again, I'm going to break this down. Saccharide, again, is referring to the sugar. The prefix di means two. The prefix poly means many. So when you're looking at a disaccharide, you've got two monosaccharides strung together. Um, for example, sucrose is made up of two glucose molecules strung together. Okay, and then starch would be an example of a polysaccharide, which is many, 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 many smaller monosaccharides strung together. So these are all examples of different carbs that you could have. We got starch, which is for energy storage in plants, glycogen, which is an energy storage molecule in us, in our liver and our muscle cells. We have cellulose, which is actually a structural sugar that makes up part of plant cells. We have chitin, it's not pronounced chitin, chitin, which is a structural molecule in the cell walls of certain fungi and in exoskeletons of bugs. So there's a bajillion different monosaccharides, polysaccharides, disaccharides. They all serve a slightly different purpose, but I would like you to write down these examples. So here's, here's a very important slide to you, you guys. How do I recognize carbs? Because I, as your teacher, could ask you to recognize certain carbohydrates and certain things. So how do I recognize it? If I give you the name of it, you better be looking for that O-S-E ending. And if it has an O-S-E ending, you're looking at a sugar. Look at that. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, all O-S-E. Is that thing only made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? Looking at these pictures over here, I'm only seeing C's, O's, and H's. That means I'm probably looking at a sugar. And then this last one, does it look like a hexagon or a pentagon? So if we look at glucose, we see that hexagon shape. If you see that, it means you might be looking at a sugar. If we look at fructose, we see that pentagon shape, that five-sided figure, that might be a sugar. With sucrose, we're seeing um, a glucose and what looks like a fructose strung together. So we have that hexagon and that pentagon shape. So that can be indicative of sugars as well. So I just wanted to make sure that you realize, hey, look for all these things if I'm ever asking you to identify one. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk to you about is lipids. Um, a common name for lipids are fats, which is inclusive of any oils, any waxes, or any steroids that you could come across. Lipids are also composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, though, just like sugars are, but they are going to look very different. Um, another way to recognize lipids is that they do not dissolve in water. You've all dumped oil in water before in probably elementary school. The two do not mix. They will separate from one another, and there are chemistry reasons for that, but it is a very easy way to recognize a lipid. The monomer, or the building blocks of lipids, is going to be one glycerol molecule and then three fatty acid molecules. So up here in this picture, up in the upper right-hand corner, over on this side, we have that glycerin, that glycerol molecule that you see on the end. And then we have these three tails coming off. Those are your fatty acid tail molecules, okay? Um, this section down here, the polar head of a lipid molecule is going to be hydrophilic, which is attracted to water, and then the tails are actually going to be hydrophobic, that is going to repel water. So um, we'll talk about more what that means for lipids properties in class, but for now, just make sure that you've noted that there's a part of lipids that is hydrophilic and a part of lipids that is hydrophobic. Um, so polymer examples of lipids, oils, fats, and waxes, they are what we call triglycerides. Um, that prefix tri meaning three and then glycerides referring to um, 
that glycerol fatty molecule, okay? So once again, we have down here a nice pictorial example of what a triglyceride can look like. Oils are used as long-term energy storage in seeds and fruits. Fats are going to be long-term energy storage in animals, and waxes are waterproof protective coatings, like the type of protective coating you would find on the outside of a leaf. There are multi-ring lipids as well. Steroid hormones are examples of lipids. Uh, you'll not come across a lot of examples of those in this class. I'll talk about them a little bit, um, but not a whole lot. If you take any higher level science, you'll look at steroid molecules in depth though. Another example of multi-ring lipids are carotenoids, the pigment that you find in carrots. Um, that's an example of a multi-ring lipid as well. Uh, you've heard the term saturated versus unsaturated fats before, I'm sure. Saturated fats, you probably know, are not great for you. Unsaturated fats are better for you. Um, but the difference is really kind of exemplified in this picture. So a saturated fat is going to look like this one on the top. When I say saturated fat, it, what that means is saturated with hydrogen. So you'll see here that as many spots as hydrogen can be in, it is in. Versus down here in the unsaturated fatty acid, you see these little double bonds that are existing between the carbons there. And that kind of bends the molecule. You see how it's not straight. Our body is really, really, really easily able to store this. It just stacks that and stacks that and stacks that and stacks that and stacks that and, stacks that, um, and is able to store that fat versus this one that's a little bendy, a little bit less easy for our body to just stack, 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 stack. So this one doesn't get stored as fat nearly as much as this one would. It's much, much harder for our body to process um, this one on the bottom and store it. And you can kind of see that over here as well. This is a saturated fat. This is an unsaturated fat. And it just looks a lot different. An easy way to tell just looking at a sample of fat, if it's saturated or unsaturated, is saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fats tend to be liquids at room temperature. So things like olive oil, vegetable oil, those are going to be unsaturated versus um, lard or butter is like a saturated fat. How do you recognize lipids? Well, you're going to ask yourself, is it only made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? If so, you might be either dealing with a sugar or a lipid. If there's a huge chain coming off of the molecule of just carbon and hydrogen like you see here and here, you might be dealing with a lipid. And if it's basically in a straight line or a straight line that's very slightly curved, you're probably dealing with a lipid. So those three things are ways to recognize that molecule. Proteins is going to be third on the list of stuff here. Um, so proteins are going to be composed of not only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but also nitrogen and sulfur as well. Proteins are built of amino acids. So their building block, their monitor, mo not monitor, monomer, are these things down here in this picture called amino acids. And they, there are 20 of them. We got glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, proline, serine, threonine, cysteine, tyrosine, asparagine, glutamine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, lysine, um, arginine, and histidine. So anybody who's a fan of Jurassic Park would maybe recognize lysine because in Jurassic Park those dinosaurs were genetically engineered to be lysine deficient. And so that was the argument that 
they wouldn't be able to survive on their own because they didn't have the ability to produce their own lysine or something like that. Um, so you may, you may have recognized the name there. Proteins are going to have a basic structure though, which you see pictured in this upper right hand corner up here. Um, nitrogen bonded to a carbon bonded to a carbon with some hydrogens, some oxygen and hydroxyl groups, and then a variable side chain. So whenever you see this R, it means that this part can vary, which is kind of obvious when you look at the different amino acids because these parts that are highlighted down here are very different from one another, whereas the basic other structure is the same. Okay, so a polymer of a protein is going to be a polypeptide. Once again, we see that um, prefix poly meaning many, and then peptide refers to the protein itself. Okay, so examples of proteins, um, collagen, keratin, silk, microtubules that you find in muscles, viruses have protein coats on them. Uh, there's a ton of different protein examples. Pretty much all of our body is made up of proteins. So anything in our body could be an example of something that's made from a protein. Some proteins are regulatory. Um, so like insulin and hormones are going to be there to regulate some body functions. There are transport proteins. One of those examples is called hemoglobin. That's the protein that carries oxygen to your cells. That's attached to your red blood cells, and that's what makes them red. Some things are storage proteins, like egg whites and seed proteins store nutrients for um, little growing organisms. There are some proteins that are toxic, like botulism toxin and uh, the diphtheria toxin. There are some proteins that act as enz enzymes, so, so they're basically proteins with a job. They assist in chemical reactions and control reaction rates. And then there's muscle cell proteins that assist with movement. So again, we have a bunch of different things that proteins can do. Our entire body is basically made up of them. There is a very specific type of bond in between proteins. It's called a peptide bond. So once again, we have that word peptide referring to protein. So really, the protein bond is in between the proteins. And when they bond together, they do something called a condensation reaction. Now, I'm not super worried about you knowing about that. We're not going to talk about that a lot, but I included it in here because that is how they bond together. How do you recognize proteins? Well, one, is it comprised of carbon, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen? If the answer is yes, you're probably dealing with a protein. And second, are you seeing this rough structure here? So we have the nitrogen, carbon, carbon. We have those oxygens on our group and our hydrogens. Honestly, you guys, though, the number one thing I would look for in a generic structure is NCC and a variable R group. That's going to be like a dead giveaway that you're dealing with a protein. Last on our list that we have to talk about is nucleic acids. Uh, nucleic acids are going to be composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, but also phosphorus. So phosphorus is the new one on that list. That is unique to nucleic acids. The monomers or building blocks of nucleic acids are nucleotides. So you see that commonality in the word. We have N-U-C-L-E up there, N-U-C-L-E down here. That's very common. So anytime you see that, um, you should be clued in that we're talking about a nucleic acid. Okay, so a nucleotide is made up of three things. It is made up of a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. I will be asking you to recognize the three parts of nucleotides at some point. So sugar, phosphate, base is what you should tell yourself. 
sugar, phosphate, base, sugar, phosphate, base, those three things make up the building block of a nucleic acid. Common examples of nucleic acids include basically only two things, DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid, that's our genetic information, that's what's in us, and also ribonucleic acid or RNA. So DNA contains a bunch of information and it's very important because it determines all of our traits and all the traits of every other organism that happens to have DNA. And it's also going to direct cellular activities. RNA, the other example, ribonucleic acid, again, same basic thing. It's gonna store information, but also RNA in us is going to transfer information from DNA to other places in our cells. And it's essential for making and producing proteins. RNA can also act as an enzyme, so it can do stuff other than that as well. So there's a couple of things that I'd like to draw your attention to about RNA and DNA. Um, DNA here is double-stranded. We see that double helix shape. RNA, on the other hand, is single-stranded. So if I were to ask you to tell the difference between them, you should know DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded. And then again, over here, I'd like to point out those nucleotides are really, really easy to identify here. We have one nucleotide right there. We have one right here. We have one right here. We have one right there. Okay. And if you were looking at me like I am insane, how the heck did I know that? Well, we have a sugar, a phosphate, and a base, just like I was circling on the other side. And again, this is the first time you're seeing it. We will do practice with this so that you can get better at recognizing those. How do you recognize a nucleic acid if I were to ask you to do it? Well, there's a few different ways. You could recognize that nucleotide as I was asking you to do before. So you could go about circling those. Um, you could look at this spirally shape that you're seeing in RNA and DNA and you could be like, hey, guess what? I'm looking at nucleic acid because I see that spirally shape. You could recognize it by looking at what it's composed of, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, you could say, hey, is it double-stranded? Well, then I'm looking at DNA. Um, there's a ton of different ways, but again, you will get practice with this. This is the notes PowerPoint. Um, this is the first time you're hearing a lot of these things, so do your best right now. We're going to take this in steps when we get back from winter break. So I just want you to kind of do the notes and just have this as a reference for now. So um, have an amazing winter break and I will see you when we get back.